security environment as the most dangerous I've seen is in 40 years in uniform. And a big portion of that are the cooperation, number one, between the PRC and Russia. Again, in President Xi's words, a relationship that has not been seen in 100 years. And we should listen to him when he speaks. They tell us what, what they're thinking about. So that cooperation from those two authoritarian nations puts us in a different security environment. So I'm very concerned about that. It's amplified with regard to the DPRK supporting Russian in the form of uh, ballistic missiles and other munitions and capabilities. My sense is this is a way to combat the broadened United States alliances, partnerships with our like-minded allies and partners. This is their counter. But I articulated we're almost back to the axis of evil when you plug in Iran to this problem set. That set of cooperation is concerning, and it should be concerning to the whole globe. This weekend, at an unknown location, a few dozen former cabinet members, senior military officials, academics, and think tank analysts met to evaluate the world military situation. The author of this article from Asia Times, David P. Goldman, a Columbia University-educated American economic strategist and contributor to Asia Times, was present at the meeting at this to say in quotations i can say that i haven't been so scared since the fall of 1983 when i was a junior contract researcher doing odd jobs for the then special assistant to the president norman a bailey at the national security council that was the peak of the cold war now the u.s foreign policy has staked its credibility on humiliating Russia by pushing NATO borders to within a few hundred kilometers of Moscow, while attempting to crush Moscow's economy with sanctions. It pulled every chip it had with European governments, mobilizing its legion of journalists, think tankers, and stipended politicians to promote the Ukrainian proxy war, with the intent of degrading Russia's armed forces and ultimately forcing a regime change in Russia. So in this video, I will cover what Mr. Goldman reported from that meeting, which is quite alarming as to what Western officials discuss behind closed doors. And what you will take from this article is that these Western, often high-ranking officials are hell-bent on winning in Ukraine despite all the facts and evidence to the contrary. Facts which, though they dismiss them in their speeches to the public, are very well known and even admitted to in private meetings. It shows to me that there is simply no plan B for Ukraine and their unwillingness to accept defeat and a new world order is the only thing pushing the West into continuing a war that they know is lost. Let's get into it. Messaging from the most distinguished participants of this meeting, former cabinet members with defense and national security portfolios, is that NATO is still determined to win at any cost. The question is whether Russia can generate strategic deserves, as was said by one of the rapporteurs in the meeting. Another quotation, its officer corps is at 50% strength and it has no depth of non-commissioned officers. Here are some other quotes that were said at the meeting. The Russians are taking massive losses of 25 to 30,000 troops a month, a former official added. They can't sustain the will to fight on the battlefield. The Russians are close to a breaking point. Can they sustain their national will? Not if the rigged election of Vladimir Putin this month has any indication, they opined. The economy has real vulnerability. We need to double the sanctions and financial interdiction of supplies getting to Russia. The Russians, they said, have a Potemkin portrayal of strength. Mr. Goldman, in the Asia Times articles, reports that all of the above is demonstrably false, and get this, is known to be false by the rapporteurs in question. He says that the notion that Russia is taking 25,000 to 30,000 casualties per month is ludicrous. Artillery counts for at least 70% of casualties in the war and Russia is simply firing 5 to 10 times as many shells as Ukraine. 
Russia has carefully avoided frontal assaults to preserve their manpower. And thus, and I will add my opinion here, the claim of Russian human wave tactics has been debunked yet again, as it was by retired US Colonel Alex Leshinin in my previous video on the article from Russi. But here's another piece of evidence that many have seemed to have forgotten, which also debunks these wild claims of Russian casualties. How many of you remember the Pentagon leak which occurred around this same time last year, shortly before the Ukrainian counteroffensive? The Pentagon is now investigating what appears to be secret documents about the war in Ukraine that were leaked online. They appear to be U.S. and NATO military documents with classification markings of secret and top secret. U.S. officials say the documents look like real slides from the Pentagon. Я напрягаю другое, что там есть информация, которая в принципе противник по американцы не должен знать про нас, про наши планы. Там есть, конечно, из открытых источников анализ наших материалов, но есть материалы, которые, судя по всему, добыты путем разведки. Это должно нас настораживать. Well, let me jog your memory. This is what AP, Associated Press, revealed about those documents in April of last year. And I'm going to quote directly from the article. At least one of the documents shown estimates of Russian troop deaths in the Ukraine war that are significantly lower than numbers publicly stated by US officials. In those leaked documents, under a section titled Total Assessed Losses, one document listed 16,000 to 17,500 Russian casualties and up to 71,000 Ukrainian casualties, which discredits General Mark Milley's claim in November of 2022 that Russia had lost well over 100,000 soldiers and that Ukraine had lost about the same. Based on these leaked Pentagon documents, Western military officials were working on the basis that Ukraine was taking at least four times the amount of casualties that the Russians were taking. And so the point is, US officials know that they are lying to you. They know that Russia is winning and they know that the Russian military is not being weakened by Ukraine in any significant way. Let's get back to the article. The most important fact about Putin's re-election is that, and get this, 88% of Russians voted a much higher turnout than in any Western democracy. Russians may not have had much of a choice of a candidate, but they had a choice of voting or not. And the massive turnout is consistent with Putin's 85% approval rating according to the independent Levada poll. Can you not see this is a war of attrition? They've taken that side of Ukraine. All they have to do is wait it out. And if what you're saying is right about the Russian economy, why was Putin elected in this landslide? You must admit Putin is more popular in Russia than any European leader is in Western Europe, let alone Joe Biden in the United States. Uh, I would disagree with that. If Putin was well, so confident, why did he have Navalny killed? Okay. And if you take a look had, at the did, voting, well, where people had came out killed. And Navalny only had 5% of the vote in any Western polling of uh, Russia. He didn't need him killed, did he? If he, uh, as Western uh, media claims, he did have him killed, he was not going to win the election. And just on that particular point you make there, are you saying that Joe Biden is more popular in the United States right now than Vladimir Putin is in Russia? I would say yes, if you got to the real... Uh, what, what basis? Really are, what basis? I mean, look opinions. at Statista, which uses uh, the German-based polling firm. Look at every polling firm. I'm talking about Western polling. I'm not talking about Russian Kremlin propaganda ones. You think Biden is more popular in the United States than Putin is in Russia? We're realistically, sure. But basically, if Putin was so popular, why did he not just let Navalny run against him and let him in a well, Putin denies any election. involvement in uh, Navalny, who well, I must say yeah, is yeah, hated. I have to just say, I'm up? speaking why to from a Muslim country. We have anyone can look on uh, online to see Navalny saying the extermination of Muslims was his agenda. So uh, we have to be careful about uh, talking about Navalny in extreme uh, right-wing uh, nationalist who supported the occupation of Crimea that I, I thought you oppose. Instead of collapsing, Russia has become the focal point for a reorganization of global supply chains and their financing and its economy is growing rather than shrinking by half, as President Biden promised in March of 2022. Russia's economy is now a backwater, isolated and struggling. 
Green, on the other hand, the article reports, is running out of soldiers and cannot agree on a new conscription law. In challenges right now. One is ammunition. Russia has a fire's advantage against them, which means they're firing more artillery shells at them at a rate of five to one. And secondly, Ukraine is not replacing its casualties at a one-for-one -one level. So many of the frontline units are being hollowed out in place over time. Some of them are missing 30% of the soldiers that they need to do their mission completely. One prominent military historian stated, everywhere you go in Ukraine, you see young men hanging around and not in uniform. Ukraine, the article says, refuses to go all in. Russia produced anywhere between four to seven times more artillery shells than Ukraine. First of all, the Russians do outnumber, in terms of artillery, they outnumber uh, the Ukrainians. The, the, the estimates vary. Some say four, five, six to one, others say 10, 15 to one, others say 20 to one. Ukraine's air defenses are exhausted as its old Soviet-era anti-aircraft missiles have been fired and NATO's stocks of Patriot missiles are dwindling. To the contrary, Russia has an inexhaustible supply of Soviet-era large bombs fitted with cheap guidance systems fired accurately at Ukrainian targets from Russian aircraft standing 60 miles off. With five times Ukraine's population, Russia is winning the war of attrition. Another rapporteur at the weekend meeting denounced Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz and other European leaders for worrying too much about the nuclear threshold, that is, the point of escalation at which Russia might use nuclear weapons. He demanded that Germany supply its long-range Taurus cruise missile to Ukraine with a 1,000 kilometer range and a two-stage warhead suitable for destroying major infrastructure. Senior German Air Force officers last month discussed using 20 of the Taurus missiles and get this, to destroy the Kerch Bridge linking Crimea to the Russian mainland in a conversation that was covertly recorded and published by Russian media. Ich kann nochmal schnell ergänzen wegen der Brücke, weil wir die uns intensiv angeguckt haben und die Brücke ist ähm, leider aufgrund ihrer Größe ähm, wie ein Flugplatz. Das heißt, es kann durchaus sein, dass ich dafür 10 oder 20 Flugkörper brauche. Ja, das ist voll geschätzt, wenn es da nur aufklappt, wenn er die Pfeiler nimmt. Ja, und das, der, der Pfeiler, da machen wir unter Umständen nur ein Loch rein und dann stehen wir da. Ja, ja. Also, ich sag mal, um da eine valide Aussage zu haben, müssten wir es wirklich selber mal... Ich wollte auch nicht die Brücke definieren, ich würde sagen, das war so eine pragmatische Ansatz, was wollen die Woche? Aber genau. Wie das hin und wie schnell könnte ich die dafür ausbilden? Und am Ende, das zweite, ja. was bleibt, ist, dass wir den, die image-temporalisierten Missionen... Conversation also revealed the presence of hundreds of British and other NATO personnel on the ground in Ukraine. Taking the war to Russia's homeland and destroying major infrastructure is one way to transform this proxy war with Ukraine into a general European war. Another way is to deploy NATO soldiers in Ukraine, something that French President Emmanuel Macron has broached and which even Asia Times admits the most certainly does not intend to do. This of course is a statement that I agree with in my recent videos calling out President Macron's bluff what was remarkable about this meeting, the journalist said, is that not a word was said about a possible negotiated solution to the conflict. Any negotiated outcome at this juncture would award Russia the eastern Ukrainian oblasts that it has annexed and probably give Russia a buffer zone reaching to the east bank of the Dnieper River, followed by a normalization of economic relations between Western Europe and Russia. In such a scenario, Russia would emerge triumphant and American assets in Western Europe would be degraded. The impact of America's world standing would be devastating. As several attendees observed, Taiwan is watching carefully to see what happens to American proxies. This point was made in an older video of mine that performed well called the New World Order. The Asia Times columnist writes that the rules of the meeting prevent him from saying much more than he has already said, but notes that he is free to report on what he told the gathering, which is that among other things, sanctions against Russia have failed 
miserably because Russia had access to unlimited amounts of Chinese as well as Indian imports both directly and through a host of intermediaries including Turkey and the former Soviet Union republics. And here is the key part of the article. The journalist said that no one disputed the data he presented and more importantly, no one in the meeting actually believed that Russia is taking 25 to 30,000 casualties per month. The facts, he said, were not an issue in the meeting. The assembled dignitaries simply could not imagine a world in which America no longer gave the orders. And here, my friends, is the final and most chilling line of the article. They are accustomed to running things and they will gamble the world away to keep their position.